Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. Kevin Andrews was, uh, has served as a federal member for Menzies in Victoria since 1991. He was appointed the first minister for ageing uh, as it was uh, 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 in uh, 2001. In 2003, he became minister for employment and workplace relations and entered the cabinet. In 2007, he was made minister for immigration and citizenship. Kevin is a great believer in policy research and development. He served as chair of the Coalition Federalism Task Force and its Policy Review and Coordination Committee, where we had a lot to do uh, together with Menzies. Uh, Menzies the centre, not the seat. Um, Kevin is currently the Shadow Minister for Families, Housing and Human Services. Prior to entering Parliament, Kevin practised law was at the bar and was named Australian Young Lawyer of the Year for his community work in establishing a legal scheme for disaster victims and for publishing a book for seniors about the law. He's an avid cyclist, and he was long before it became an essential quality for political advancement. Um, <laughs> um, he is married to Margaret, who welcome here today, and they have five children. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Andrews. Um, thank you very much, Tom, to you, to May from the Menzies uh, Centre, to Alex from the CPA, and my parliamentary colleague, uh, Steve Chobo, the member for uh, Moncrief, and uh, former parliamentary colleague, uh, Jim Carlton. Uh, we were both in Parliament together at the, towards the end of Jim's uh, long and illustrious career and at the beginning of mine. I won't put the rest of it in. It's great to be here. Uh, particularly, can I say thank you to the Menzies Research Centre for the ongoing work that they do. The development of policy is so important for not just a political party, but for the future of a country. And uh, it was Bob Menzies himself who said that the time in opposition can be one of the most profitable times for a political party if it uses it wisely uh, and substantively, and that is to get down and look at the challenges and the problems facing a country and to engage in that process of looking at the solutions that are needed for the future. And hopefully that's something which we've been doing over the last few years, which will set us up uh, for government whenever that uh, may occur again. I can also thank the CPA for um, hosting uh, this event. Uh, CPA is one of those institutions in Australian society, but it has a particular resonance in terms of why we're here this morning. Uh, there wouldn't be a charitable or voluntary uh, organisation in Australia uh, for whom services are not provided by members of the accounting profession. And often that's done on a voluntary and pro bono basis, uh, and it's something which is part of the vitality of civil society in this country. So we thank you for your interest in good policy development, but through you, Alex, to those many tens of thousands of members who actually provide that service to the community and therefore make Australia a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, the Leader of the Opposition, Tony Abbott, has outlined the direction that a Liberal National Party government would take in a number of important areas in a series of speeches over the last few months. These directions include a stronger economy, stronger borders, better infrastructure, a cleaner environment and stronger communities. In his fifth address just last week, Mr Abbott placed these initiatives in the context of working for the benefit of all the Australian people, and I quote, more capable and more contented individuals living in stronger and more cohesive communities is the goal of the five policy plans that the Liberal National Coalition has announced this year. The purpose of good government is better people. Ladies and gentlemen, my purpose today is to expand on the theme of Mr Abbott's policy directions, particularly in the relationship between the government and the institutions of civil society. The Coalition has been considering its future policy directions for the past four years, first under the chairmanship of Julie Bishop, and then myself, and then for the past two years uh, under the chairmanship of Andrew Rolfe. Not only have we undertaken detailed policy work, but we've also considered the overall role of government. Andrew Robb has indicated there, there are a number of pillars of our policy response. The coalition government will live within its means, back our nation's strengths, reverse the nanny state, and restore a culture of personal responsibility. To quote Andrew, 
Reversing the nanny state requires a clear philosophical shift from the instinct that government knows best to reducing government involvement in business and in people's lives. Removing productivity sapping reporting requirements across sectors, adding flexibility to the labour market and providing greater autonomy are all powerful ways of limiting the reach of government. He continued, Restoring a culture of personal responsibility instills faith in the individual, business and other enterprise to make decisions that are in their own interest, not in the interests of bureaucrats and politicians. This freedom helps produce the best outcomes. For example, it fosters a spirit of enterprise, self-sufficiency and reduces reliance on government to shape destinies. So ladies and gentlemen, it's against this background that Tony and Andrew have outlined that I turn to the role of civil society. In his famous oration to commemorate the Athenians who died in the uh, Peloponnesian Wars against Sparta, Pericles extolled democracy and praised the ancient city-state as the envy of the world. He reminded his fellow citizens that democracy comprised not only a constitution with equality before the law and opportunity for all, but the day-to-day -day relations of Athenians with each other. It is the laws themselves are obeyed, including, to quote Pericles, unwritten laws that is an acknowledged shame to break. Now, although Pericles did much to extend democracy in the to the citizens of Athens, many of the greatest thinkers of the time doubted this new form of government. Plato believed that democracies deteriorate into licence, and Aristotle, although less severe, noted that constitutions can be captured by groups interested only in their own selfish ends. A cursory survey of the 20th century illustrates this, these misgivings. Nations with apparently democratic constitutions were in fact totalitarian regimes that denied even the most basic human rights to many people. Indeed, many remain so. And in other places, democracy flowered only to wither as special groups replaced government by the people and for the people. So despite the trappings, the formal constitutions, the grand national councils, the political titles, fundamental elements of democracy have been missing from many systems of government. Jean Bethke Elstein has written, democracy is not simply a set of procedures or a constitution, but an ethos, a spirit, a way of responding and a way of conducting oneself. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the habits, dispositions and culture of a people that undergird democracy. Consequently, a state without public discussion and civil association lacks a democratic life force. Alexis de Tocqueville observed almost 200 years ago that it's the association of people in a myriad of groups and organisations that underpins the modern democratic experiment. This web of associations, what Edmund Burke referred to as the little platoons to which we belong, has become known as civil society. They are the relationships and institutions that are neither created nor controlled by the state. The essential task of civil society, that is families, neighbourhood life, and the web of religious, economic, educational and civic associations, is to foster confidence and character in individuals, build social trust, and help children to become good people and good citizens. Hence, democracy is built upon the virtues of personal and civic responsibility. And this notion is not new. Adam Smith, in the theory of moral sentiments, posited the centrality of ethical values, including care for others, as a necessary basis for the market system. And his observation on the New American Republic, Tocqueville said, amongst the laws that rule human societies, there is one which seems to be more precise and clear than all others. If men are to remain civilised or to become so, the art of associating together must grow and improve in the same ratio in which the equality of conditions is increased. It is this sense of mutual association that Tocqueville observed in America that stands at the heart of a well-functioning democratic nation, and it's not a new notion. Civil society is critical to a liberal democracy like Australia, because individuals gain meaning and identity from their relationships with others, 
a liberal democracy dedicated to full and free human development cannot afford to ignore the conditions that are most conducive to the fulfilment of that ideal. If we do, then liberal democracy neglects the very basis of its own maintenance, because it's in the institutions of civil society, in families and in voluntary associations, that democracy is sustained by balancing the power of both the market and the state, and by helping to counter both consumerist and totalitarian tendencies. The Harvard scholar Mary Ann Glendon writes, and I quote, the myriad of associations that generate social norms are the invisible supports of, and the sine qua non for, a regime in which individuals have rights. Neither the older political and civil rights, nor the newer economic and, and social rights, can be secure in the absence of the social arrangements that induce those who are disadvantaged by the rights of others to accept the restrictions and interferences that such rights entail. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if we cannot preserve and support the institutions of community in which relationships are developed and nurtured, then we're not merely placing at risk the welfare of many people, particularly the young and the elderly. We are, un we are weakening the very foundations of democracy itself. And as many as observed, of all political systems, democracy most depends upon the competence and character of its citizens. A liberal democracy presupposes civic virtue to a higher degree than any other form of government. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some 600,000 voluntary and charitable organisations in Australia representing a wide diversity of interests, groups and services. The, ma the vast majority of them, about 440,000, are small, unincorporated entities. Another 136,000 are incorporated associations, many of them also small. 9,000 incorporated by other means, including 2,500 Indigenous corporations and 1,850 are cooperatives. Just 11,700 are companies limited by guarantee. And of the more than 600,000, less than one-tenth are deemed economically significant by the ABS, that is, employed paid staff and or have an active tax base, although this is a narrow measure. Excluding volunteers, the sector made a 4.1% contribution to GDP in 2006-07, a contribution of $43 billion. Almost 320,000 people were employed in the sector, which also attracted 4.6 million volunteers. A sense of community responsibility was reflected in the institutions that developed in the late part of the 19th century in this nation. For a century in Australia, from the 1860s, friendly societies flourished. Later, credit unions and building societies reflected the self-help and mutual obligation ideas of the era. Not only did they build communities, but they encouraged discipline, responsibility and thrift amongst individuals. The expansion of the welfare state in the 1970s and the increase in the demand for a range of services over the past two decades and the outsourcing of services previously delivered by government has resulted in a significant increase in government funding to not-for-profit organisations. However, it should be recalled that the vast majority of these organisations exist without government funding, either at all or in any ongoing and significant manner. While a Productivity Commission report relates primarily to the larger organisations and those in receipt of government funding, a proper consideration of the not-for-profit sector should include the extraordinarily diverse range of services involved. And these organisations, as you know only too well, can be found in every corner of Australia, ranging from the local sporting clubs to cultural groups to service clubs and other community assistance bodies. They generate much of the vitality of our communities. Ladies and gentlemen, the political community should be of service to civil society, which is the collection of relationships and resources, culturally and associative, that are relatively independent of the political and economic spheres of activity. As Tony Abbott reminded us last week, government should be for the people's benefit. My own experiences and as, as an employee, a board member and a volunteer in a number of not-for-profit bodies over more than three decades, like Tony's work as a volunteer, 
have helped to shape our views. Drawing on this experience, I'd like to outline the coalition approach to the not-for-profit sector, or civil society as I would prefer to name it. The description not-for-profit immediately connotes an economic framework, whereas civil society conveys a different, broader notion of which the economic is one part. The Productivity Commission itself accepted this broader role for the sector and noted the tensions that arise from the conflict between the economic and other objectives. The institutions of civil society are important because they are neither created by nor controlled by the state. Public funding requires accountability and services require training skills and a professional approach. But it is important that the independence and the volunteering ethos of the sector is protected and encouraged. We should guard against unnecessary state control of civil society. There is a danger that government can seduce community groups into becoming its mouthpiece. And there is a danger that government will see the voluntary sector as just an extension of itself. I was reminded of this concern when reading a speech by a former New Zealand Labor government minister to a conference on social inclusion here in Melbourne. In it, Steve Mahari, now Vice-Chancellor of Massey University and formerly a New Zealand government minister for nine years, said, and I quote, Community organisations have to accept that they must have professional management and rely less on volunteers. Volunteering is still vital to the core of a community group of any size that needs to be paid and accountable. There are too many community groups. While new community groups will always appear in response to a need, if real progress is to be made, rationalisation of numbers is essential. He continued, local communities need volunteer centres where induction and training can be provided and there has to be full funding of the work that community groups are asked to do." Unquote. Now, while aspects of these statements are unremarkable, taken together, they raise a concern. There is a sense in these remarks that the voluntary sector is viewed as another arm of government to be directed, regulated and funded like an agency of the state. The essence of the third or voluntary sector of civil society is that individuals gather together to address issues that they perceive are in need of a response. Most often this is at the local level. Surely there cannot be too many community groups. The suggestion that there are too many groups smacks of a command approach and bureaucratic control. One only has to look to Britain to see how non-government organisations can morph into quasi-government organisations. According to the National Council for Voluntary Organisations, 25,000 British charities received more than three quarters of their funding from government. Having courted a new constituency of charitable organisations, the danger is that government can politicise that partnership to the point of crudely suggesting that only support for the party in government will maintain the massive levels of funding. When civil society accepts this arrangement, it effectively has lost its independence. What does it matter, you may ask, if civil and civic organisations and charitable organisations become arms of government? A blending of the role of government and the civil sector risks the domination of the government sphere over all others. Do not forget that every state power tends to look upon all liberty with a suspicious eye, warned the Dutch statesman Abraham Kuyper. The ancient history of all people replays a shameful spectacle Despite stubborn, sometimes heroic struggle, the freedom of the spheres die out and state power becomes Caesarean triumphs. Ladies and gentlemen, when the state directs the activity of civil society, it enfeebles the ability of citizens to take responsibility for their own community and their own society. As Tony Abbott said last week, the risk when government tackles problems that are best addressed in the community is that people are denied the chance to achieve something for themselves. And the practical outcome is all too familiar. A one-size-fits-all approach to social problems, ensnared by contractual obligations designed to fit governmental silos which rob much of the individual and personal initiative that we should motivate. Worse, it endangers the vibrancy of the institutions that help to form citizens in the virtues. The act of giving, whether finances, services or counsel, becomes a professional activity and a function of the state, rather than an act of charity and love directed to fellow human beings. 
This is not to say that the state has no role to play in other spheres of society. Rather, it is to assert that free citizens should ensure that the state is an enabler of other spheres of human activity, not a master of them. So ladies and gentlemen, it's against this background that I wish to outline the Coalition's approach to three topical issues. The Gillard Government is proposing to establish a new Charities Commission, modelled loosely on the one operating in the United Kingdom. According to a current draft of the legislation, the object is, and I quote, to protect and enhance public trust and confidence in the not-for-profit sector by establishing a national regulatory framework and the commissioner of the proposed ACNC. Although initially operating as part of the Australian Tax Office, it is envisaged that the new body will become a separate regulatory agency. The overriding purpose of the draft legislation is to register entities as a prerequisite for assessing and granting certain tax concessions. This is the role currently undertaken by the Tax Office. The draft, however, goes on to establish a major new regulatory agency with sweeping powers. Nowhere has the mischief that requires this new monolithic regulatory structure been identified. Consider just a few of the more than 150 pages of proposed legislation. The draft sets out a series of governance principles. One is, and I quote, to enable the public, including the members, donors and volunteers of a registered entity, to know the purposes of the registered entity. Now surely this can be established in a much simpler, less costly, less burdensome manner than a whole new regulatory regime. The requirement that each organisation publish details on its website would achieve the same end. Another section states, and I quote, a registered entity must not have a person as a responsible entity if having the person as a responsible entity would undermine public trust and confidence in the governance or operation of the registered entity, unquote. Not only does this involve a reverse onus on the entity, it would necessitate an examination of the activities of every potential person on the governing board of the entity against a vague standard. Another section states, and again I quote, a registered entity must establish and maintain processes for ensuring that it does nothing that places Australia in breach of its international law obligations. Once again, this is a burdensome provision that will require many charities to obtain legal and other advice about a myriad of international laws, covenants and treaties. Worse, these and other provisions treat the civil sector with state paternalism. If entities or their directors break the law, they can be prosecuted. If existing laws need strengthening, let the government make out the case for doing so, replete with the examples of the breaches that need to be rectified. But nowhere has the mischief that this bill assumes been made out. It is a power grab by the government, which will extend extraordinary powers to bureaucrats to reach into the affairs of organisations ranging from local congregations to national charities. Under the provisions of the draft bill, individuals ranging from a local parish minister through to the archbishop of a diocese could be suspended or removed by the commission. And every entity will be required to meet a new complex set of reporting requirements that will cost charitable organisations, including, as I said, local congregations, thousands of dollars. Officers of the commission will have powers to inspect and seize records. This is an extraordinary reach by government into the affairs of civil society. It assumes that people who give up their time and efforts, often in a voluntary capacity, are untrustworthy and tainted. Ladies and gentlemen, the Coalition will adopt a different approach. First, we recognise that there is a place for a national body to enhance the role of the institutions of civil society. Accordingly, we will support a small commission as an educative and training body. We will work with the sector to ensure that it represents the sector and we will work with the sector to transfer responsibility and governance of the Commission to the sector over the next few years. Under the Coalition, the Independent Charities Commission will provide education and support services to registered charities, provide information to assist with the process of regulation for new charities and not-for-profit agencies, act as a one-stop shop for information on charitable organisations and agencies active operating within Australia, advocate for the rights of charities and not-for-profit agencies, 
represent the interests of charities and not-for-profit agencies to government, help facilitate the interaction between government and the charitable and not-for-profit sector, undertake research and cross-sector evaluations on issues of concern to the sector, and help innovation within the sector. We will also ask the new body to coordinate with the sector, the Commonwealth, the states and the territories, to propose a new common financial and other reporting standard that will negate the practice of numerous reports being prepared each year for different funding and regulatory bodies. We will retain the regulatory powers that already exist in the ATO and ASIC and other similar bodies and we will not transfer them to the new Commission. Until and unless there is harmonisation of various Commonwealth state and territory laws, the proposed Commission simply adds yet another of regulation and bureaucracy to the sector. And I note in this context that the states have not agreed to hand over any of their powers in this area to the new Commission. We will respect the role of the states and will work with them to achieve harmony in relation to fundraising codes and other regulations. Ladies and gentlemen, the ACNC was conceived as a body to support charities and not-for-profits to enhance their contribution to society. Its role appears to be more about policing and enforcement as outlined in the exposure draft of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Bill. For example, the powers to investigate any breach of the law, powers to remove a responsible person, as I've outlined earlier. No evidence has been put forward of cases of non-compliance by charitable entities which could justify the seemingly heavy-handed reforms or how the proposed reforms would address any current problems. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, we will retain the current common law definition of charity and maintain the public benefit test. This is consistent with the evidence-based reviews of the 2001 Charities Definition Inquiry, the Henry Review and the Productivity Commission Report. It is already part of the law that an entity is not charitable if its purposes are not for the public benefit. There is a presumption, for example, that an entity whose purpose is for the, re or the relief of poverty, the advancement of education or the advancement of religion is for the public benefit. The presumption, though, is not absolute. It is rebuttable. This is acknowledged by the ATO in a key ruling, and I quote, public benefit may be prima facie assumed unless the contrary appears. Where the contrary appears, an applicant must prove benefit. If a relevant regulator believes that an entity is not a charitable on this ground, the law already provides an appropriate response. Specifically regarding advancement of religion, the ATO notes, and I quote, a purpose involving religion is not charitable if the public benefit is absent. For example, if the ATO considered that a particular religious body was not acting for the public benefit, then it has the power to revoke the body's charitable status and assess it for income tax or deny it an endorsement in the first place when it applies to the office. The onus would then be on the charitable body to challenge the assessment in the courts and to prove that it's acting in the public benefit. There is nothing preventing the ATO from adopting the same action under the current law in respect of a religious or other charitable body which the ATO considered was not acting for the public benefit. The fact that the ATO has not taken any action in this regard could reasonably lead to the inference that there is not a problem in the first place, rather than the inference that the law needs to be changed. Previous reviews do not support removal of the presumption of public benefit. The 2001 Charities Definition Inquiry recommended retention of the presumption of public benefit, and I quote, once a purpose has been established uh, to fall under the advancement of health, education, social and community, welfare, religion, culture and the environment, it would be presumed to be for the benefit of the community unless evidence to the contrary were presented. The Henry Report and the Productivity Commission Report endorsed the position of the Charities Review Inquiry. The previous attempt to remove the presumption of public benefit in the Charities Bill in 2003 was rejected after full consideration. Despite some suggestions by some to the contrary, the proposed removal of the public benefit test has nothing to do with the word investments case, for which there's a specific response in the form of the unrelated uh, business income test reforms, or the aid watch case, which there is a specific response in the form of in Australia reforms. There is no evidence to how the current law is deficient. Further, there is evidence that removal of the presumption in England and Wales has led to challenges to the status of not-for-profit religious providers of aged care and education. What is certain and uncontroversial under the current law 
risks becoming the subject of lengthy and costly dispute resolution under a revised law. Removing the presumption of public benefit is not the appropriate way to address concerns about perceived or actual problems with a particular group or organisation. The current law can be applied or, if necessary, modified to address any concerns. To use this instance as support, as evidence of support, for removing the presumption flies in the face of substantive evidence-based reviews over many years that I've referred to. We will examine any particular issues that are cause for concern. It has at times been suggested the charity sector needs review and regulation because the sector receives substantial tax concessions. But arguments about tax concessions for charities do not belong in the consultation and formulation of policy on the definition of a charity, the ACNC, uh, not-for-profit governing arrangements and charitable fundraising. The issue should not be conflated. Instead, tax reform should be considered in specific responses such as the unrelated business income test and the in Australia proposed reforms. Consistent with the approach I've outlined, the Coalition will work with the sector to address any particular issues that arise regarding the taxation treatment of charitable organisations. But we will not use discrete taxation issues as a Trojan horse to impose a burdensome new regulatory system on the sector in Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, the Coalition believes that Australia should be a philanthropic nation. There was a strong growth of philanthropy under the Howard Government. This was not only driven by successful economic policies, but there was also very strong leadership given by the Prime Minister himself. Early in the first term of the Howard Government, the Prime Minister established the Community Business Partnership to advise Government on encouraging a culture of philanthropy and giving. The partnership encouraged prominent Australians from the business and community sectors to work together for the benefit of the community. One of the great successes of this partnership was the initiative to create a new structure for planned giving in 2001, prescribed to private funds, now called private ancillary funds, as a vehicle for family and company philanthropy. A decade on, almost 1,000 of these entities have been created. $2.7 billion has been committed irrevocably to the community sector. And in 2009-10, almost $200 million was directly distributed to charities and other worthy organisations by these funds. The latest data shows that growth in philanthropy has tapered off in recent years. The global financial crisis has clearly contributed to this trend, but the sector is facing increased uncertainty because of the range of government programs that may have an impact on giving. There is no doubt, even taking into account the current difficult economic circumstances, that levels of wealth have increased, particularly in some sectors of the nation. So in short, we need another kickstart to philanthropy. I am happy to announce that the future coalition government will reinstate the Community Business Partnership, which will be chaired by Tony Abbott and bring together leading Australian philanthropists and experts from the sector. I would expect this group to provide high-level advice on practical changes the government can make to encourage new growth uh, in philanthropy and to reduce unnecessary administrative burdens affecting the community sector. And in particular, I commend the work of Philanthropy Australia and intend to work closely with it to further its objectives for the sector. Ladies and gentlemen, the charitable sector is a broad church. From the work of Anglicare and Catholic Social Services and Uniting Care to the Red Cross, Mission Australia and the Salvation Army and organisations such as Surf Life Saving Australia and the RSPCA, to name just a few. All play an important role in our society and all deserve to be treated with respect and gratitude. Family service agencies provide valuable services to the community. Many have been working with the poor, the marginalised and the vulnerable for decades. Services have arisen from perceived needs in the community. Programs ranging from parenting skills training through marriage and family education and counselling to divorce mediation, drug and alcohol assistance and addressing family violence provide information and support to hundreds of thousands of Australians annually. Many agencies are motivated by charitable intentions. They are professionally conducted, but often utilise the valuable contributions of volunteers. Government has increasingly reached into the affairs of these agencies over the past two decades. 
imposing more and more burdensome contractual and reporting requirements. For example, separate audited financial statements are often required for each funded program, even though the agency's annual financial returns are audited for annual registration purposes. Serial audits are conducted often for different programs and with different time frames. Different quality assurance measures are required of the same agencies, and masses of data are collected at considerable cost to the agency about each client, but much of this is not retrievable by the agency and is not collated by the department. Government contractual and reporting requirements cost family service agencies significant sums of money to administer. Much data is collected, but little of it is ever used. Many agencies have multiple contracts with government, with different requirements, different obligations, and different reporting. Agencies continue to expend valuable resources on meeting these requirements that could be better spent on providing services and funding innovation. The Coalition supports transparency and accountability in the use of taxpayers' funds, but it also supports simplicity and efficiency. The civil sector has a long history of responsible governance and management. The Coalition will respect and trust this. In 2010, I announced that the Coalition in Government would simplify the relationship between the Commonwealth and family service providers. Today, I can announce some more details about our approach to simplify the reporting and contractual requirements for family service agencies. We believe in working with the sector, not directing the sector, and treating it as an extension of the state. And we believe that those working in the sector, not bureaucrats working in Canberra, are best placed to tell us what can work and how we can work together to ensure that we're making life for the institutions of civil society easier, not more difficult. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the Coalition will implement one contract with the Department for each agency instead of multiple contracts. We'll require the Department to negotiate the contact the content of these contracts with the agencies instead of simply imposing them on them. We will simplify the auditing process to require only one financial audit from each agency annually. We will replace the current system of rolling audits with an initial benchmarking audit that has a period of life of five years with spot audits to be undertaken if the Commonwealth is made aware of any adverse conduct on behalf of the agency. We will simplify the reporting requirements for governance arrangements with the registration as a company or an unincorporated association sufficing as evidence of appropriate governance arrangements. We will require all funded agencies to lodge a one-page annual governance return by the chairperson of the board or governing body indicating that the body is properly governed. We will replace the current time-consuming and costly system of data collection with a requirement that each agency file a quarterly report indicating the number of clients seen by the agency according to the program area and the postcode of the client. We'll require each agency to publish on its website its annual financial return and an annual governance statement. We'll replace the current system of data collection with a series of cross-sector evaluations of the efficiency and effectiveness of various programs and will work with the sector to ensure that adequate and known whistleblower provisions are in place. Ladies and gentlemen, these changes will ensure the agencies are able to focus their time and resources on delivering vital services to the community. They also make clear that the government is supporting and empowering the valuable work of the agencies, not directing them as an arm of the state. Importantly, they clarify that the responsibility for the conduct of the service, including financial accountability, rests with the agencies themselves, not the government. If an agency or a person associated with it acts improperly, then they will be subject to existing laws. In addition, government may withdraw financial support if the public trust conferred upon them is broken. These changes would save on expenditure for both the department and the agencies. In particular, it would obviate the need for the costly, time-consuming FRSP online service of data collection. The measures would reduce reporting requirements by a significant margin, and the savings generated by agencies through the implementation of these measures would be retained by them for the provision of services. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I've taken time in this speech to outline not only some specific policies that the Coalition will adopt in my area of responsibility, but also our underlying approach. There are two approaches to the central task of politics, which is to help determine how we can all live together. One approach is summed up in the opening words of the maiden speech of the former Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Rudd, and I quote, Politics is about power. It is about the power of the state. It is about the power of the state as applied to individuals, the society in which they live, and the economy in which they work. Unquote. The other approach is about empowering the people, not exercising power over them. It is the approach that the Leader of the Opposition utilised last week when he referred to Abraham Lincoln's famous description of democracy as of the people, by the people and for the people. Ladies and gentlemen, the political community should be of service to civil society. That is what a coalition will endeavour to, to achieve in government. Thank you.